Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's World will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Covart. Hello, and welcome to episode 26 of Ben Franklin's World the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present-day world we live in. Each week, we sit down with an historian to discuss their unique insights into our early American past so we can learn more about who we are and how we can affect a better future. Today, you are in for a real treat because we have the opportunity to speak to Robert Middlecoff. Professor Emeritus of Colonial and Early United States History at the University of California, Berkeley. And we are going to talk all about George Washington. Yes, I'm really excited about this. Using details from his new book, Washington's Revolution, The Making of America's First Leader, Bob reveals how Washington grew up with will and judgment, two characteristics that prove vital to Washington and the Patriot cause during the War for American Independence what drove Washington to become a patriot, and how Washington's experiences, mistakes, and successes during the War for Independence ultimately provided him with the knowledge and skills he needed to lead the patriots to victory. But first, it's time for Ask the Historian. You pose the question, and now Liz has the answer. It's time for Ask the Historian. Today's questions come from Lance Mosier. Hello, my name is Lance Mosier, and I'm an 8th grade U.S. history teacher in Omaha, Nebraska. And my question for the Ask a Historian is, uh, what were the reasons why you wanted to become a historian? Uh, What put you into that position to take this particular field and career choice? And if you could offer any advice or suggestions, if I have students who are interested in going into a historical field or career, What types of things should they be working on at school, and what kind of directions would you give them to help proceed in this endeavor? Thanks for your questions, Lance. Okay, first, what made me want to become an historian? The answer to this question has three parts, I think. First, I love to research. There is something about the hunt for information that thrills and excites me. I get so pumped to go into a library and archive and just look through books and and stacks of papers all day looking for information. I had that passion as a young kid, even in third and fourth grade when they started assigning us reports on Native Americans or different countries or different states. I would always seek what seemed to be the most challenging topic because I just love the hunt for information. I love the challenge of it. And it's something that still excites me today. Second part to the answer is, I have parents who love history and they shared their passion for history with their kids. We grew up in New England, which seems to have a limitless supply of historic sites and house museums and other types of history museums. And we would spend a lot of our weekends and school vacations visiting what the region had to offer. So I think, you know, just from exposure, we picked up a passion for history because I don't know if you know this, but my brother is actually a high school history teacher. Basically, we have two historians in one family. Also, when we got older, my parents just didn't limit our historical education to New England. They actually bought us plane tickets and we would all fly out to different regions of the United States and visit all the museums, historic sites, national parks, and what have you that those regions have to offer. So we travel to the West Coast, the Southwest, the Southeast, the Midwest. So I'm 34 years old, and I have seen all but like five states. So that gives you an idea of how well we were traveled. We were very fortunate in that respect, and I think that really did contribute to my desire to become a historian. And lastly, I had a never-ending supply of books. Now, I didn't appreciate this as a youth, but my parents never gave us a cash allowance. All my friends had a cash allowance. This really kind of irked me. But what they didn't have and what my brother and I had was a never-ending supply of books. Basically, we did get an allowance. We just got it in the form of books. Every week, my mom would take my brother and I either to the library or the bookstore, and we would pick out new books to read. And most of the books I picked out were history books. So that definitely played a role in my decision to become an historian. And as to why I study early America, 
I credit New England. It's really hard to grow up in this region and not form an appreciation for the, the role the region played in the American Revolution. And so I just fell in love with the period at an early age, and I have never lost my passion for it. So that is why I study that, that aspect of early American history even today. Now, as for what I would tell young people who are interested in becoming historians, I guess I would tell them three things, too. First, I would encourage them to read. If they read about history, they'll find what their historical interests are, and that'll make their decision about what to study and write their theses about very easy. Also, reading is great practice for if you want to be a historian, because historians spend an awful lot of time reading. Second, I would say work on your writing skills. Take the research papers and thesis assignments that your teachers assign very seriously because they will help you improve your writing and historical thinking skills. And these are critical uh, to your work as an historian. And then finally, I would encourage your students to read primary sources. These are first person accounts of what happened. So what, no matter what they're studying, these documents were written in the period that they're studying. And sometimes that can make them a bit tough to get through because the language is different. The way they say things is different. But oftentimes they're just really fun and interesting. And I think the best way to sample the historical profession is to sample the sources that we use as historians. If you have a question that you would like to ask the historian, please send an email to liz at benfranklinsworld.com, tweet me at Liz Covart, or visit benfranklinsworld.com and click on the Ask the Historian button on the right-hand side of the website where you can ask your question just like Lance did via voicemail and then we'll air it here on the air. And now for our conversation with Robert Middlecoff. With tidings and wisdom to share about our early American past, here is this week's special guest. Robert Middlecoff is a professor emeritus of colonial and early United States history at the University of California, Berkeley. He has authored five books, including The Glorious Cause, The American Revolution, 1763 to 1789, and most recently, Washington's Revolution, The Making of America's First Leader. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Bob. Well, I'm glad to be in Franklin's world. <laughs> <laughs> and we are happy to uh, have you join us today, but we won't be talking about Ben Franklin, but George Washington and how his experiences led him to adopt an American identity. Sounds good. So many historians have written books about George Washington. What made you decide to write another one? Well, it's true. There are uh, many books about Washington. I have been interested in him for a very long time, and of course, I did quite a lot of work uh, in uh, various editions of his papers, including the microfilm edition in the uh, 1970s when I was doing research for the book you mentioned, The Glorious Cause, Washington obviously was a central figure in the revolution and the Revolutionary War, and so uh, I did read a lot of Washington's writings and uh, letters and reports and so on, including a good deal of the correspondence to him. I never thought in uh, writing The Glorious Cause that I really had finished with Washington, and uh, a lot of curiosity about him uh, and interest in him. He's in some ways an enigmatic figure difficult really to get a hold of, remained with me. And so writing the book in a way, this book, uh, Washington's Revolution, uh, is the product of a longstanding curiosity and, and interest in him. And I, I discovered that though there were uh, many books about him, uh, uh, not all had been said by any means. And uh, I don't really believe in historical duplication. I think every historian has something different to say. So I didn't feel burdened by the knowledge that there was a lot of of books about him, uh, and some of them really very good. So uh, that pretty well sums it up. That and the fact that uh, starting in 1985, I guess it was, a... Uh, the Washington editorial project that's producing the volumes that are being published now of his papers uh, by the uh, University of Virginia Press uh, 
produced or started producing in, in 85 the series uh, called the Revolutionary War Series. Uh, by the time that I finished writing this book, uh, I think there were about 21 or 22 volumes out. There hadn't been a, uh, a complete edition of Washington's writings uh, before this project got going at the end of the Second World War, and so it, it made it a lot easier. Uh, plus, it's really a first-class piece of work, and it includes uh, all the letters to him that have survived, plus a lot of uh, uh, reports that were generated by Congress and uh, by military commissions during the war. So all of that uh, added to my interest and the feeling that I really could do a pretty thoroughgoing job of, of uh, working through his papers. In Washington's Revolution, Bob states that Washington possessed two key qualities that helped him master himself and persevere during the War for American Independence, will and judgment. Bob, would you tell us how and when Washington learned those key characteristics of will and judgment? I'm not sure I'd put it that way. That is that he uh, learned them, I think, had something to do with a really powerful will that he displayed throughout his life. He uh, was somebody who was uh, he was willing to give way on his opinions and judgments if uh, the evidence was there. Uh, uh, he was always firm in his very convictions. Uh, and uh, so there was a kind of, uh, of inner force. Uh, that's part of the will, I guess. Uh, almost an aggressiveness, but it was not a, an aggressiveness of an angry man. He was he was not an angry person, but he had a powerful sense of that we would call will, powerful moral sense as well, and a sense of his own honor. All those things I think were developed through his experience, and in some ways it goes back to his early youth uh, in that he came from a family not of uncertain origins, but not a uh, family in the elite, the, the top flight social group in Virginia. He was always, well, until I suppose you'd say he married Martha, or at least late in the French and Indian War, uh, uh, late in that war, he was always uh, somewhat of on the fringe of uh, society, even though he had an awful lot to do with the powers of the elite uh, in the governor's office and in the legislature. He, he was uh, still in a, some slight way a marginal figure. And I think that determination and the, the uh, force uh, bordering on aggressiveness, I guess, would be the best way to put it, reinforced that will, uh, drew on it, and uh, strengthened it. The judgment, uh, the other characteristic that I found so powerful in him was was his judgment. Uh, he was a man who, uh, he reminded me in some curious ways of of really good scholars. He, he wanted evidence. Uh, he, he wanted to think on the terms of evidence. Uh, he was a skeptic of un, unformed or what appeared to be badly formed judgments and opinions. And his own judgment on most things was really strong and true. And uh, uh, that developed through his own experience. He, he learned to trust his own judgment and uh, to trust himself. And it came through, the, uh, in part at least, through the the demands on him as a figure of power in the military, and uh, that certainly strengthened the whole thing. Do you think his powerful will developed from a sense that he had something he wanted to prove to the elite? That's a, actually a really good question, a good way of putting it. Um, I don't. I, I doubt that he ever said to himself or was explicit in any desire to 
prove himself, but that desire was certainly there. You can see it pretty clearly in his uh, ruminations, his letters, uh, over uh, the early desire to be commissioned in the British Army, to have a royal commission. That was a way of proving himself and proving his worth and worthiness. And uh, so, yes, I suppose in answer to your question, maybe it's a qualified yes. he certainly did wish to prove himself. Since you brought up the French and Indian War, can we talk about Washington's early military experience? Would you tell us about Washington's experiences during the French and Indian War? And would you also address for us whether or not Washington actually started that war? Well, to take the last part of your <laughs> your question first, no, he did not start that war. Uh there had been antagonism, of course, uh, between uh, the British and the French for centuries. There were ample reasons or causes that were European that brought on the Seven Years' War. America was certainly at stake in that war and was one of the prizes of the war, but Washington's actions in the West certainly didn't bring it on. As for his experiences in the French and Indian War, uh, it's a really a tangled history. He learned a great deal in the 1750s during the war uh, in, in America. He became early on, of course, the uh, colonel of the uh, Virginia Regiment and, and uh, served with various British commanders under various British commanders uh, during a part of that time of course he wanted to uh, he wanted to become a uh, royal commissioned officer and and failed to persuade the British government to give him or award him that commission but in the war it was an extraordinarily difficult task that he had using really badly formed and untrained Americans in the Virginia Regiment, and but Washington had to pretty well form the men who uh, came from county militias sent off by their counties, called by the governor uh, to serve in the Virginia Regiment. They were badly trained. They were badly armed. He, he did not have the resources he needed to equip them properly or even feed them properly as a kind of forecast to the revolution. He couldn't even pay them at times. And he was expected, the tradition was, that the colonel of the regiment was responsible for making certain that their pay was forthcoming. Of course, that pay had to come, be first voted by the House of Burgesses of the legislature and then approved by the governor. So it was a difficult, tangled operation. He did his best to dealing with all parties concerned. He learned how to lead during that period, I think. And he uh, made certain mistakes, fell on his face at times. Through it all, he had to satisfy the the planters or and small farmers in the West uh, that he was going to defend them against both the French and the Indians. He had a difficult time with them. Uh, He was threatened physically at uh, several times by them when they thought that he was not uh, doing an adequate job. He uh, faced their disaffection when he was trying to recover deserters from the regiment. Uh, They sometimes settlers would hide or conceal or feed and support the deserters, uh, sometimes not, of course. So in every way, it was difficult. And through it all, he had to cooperate with the British commanders. And the last big episode that he took a part in, of course, was the drive to take Fort Pitt, Pittsburgh, uh, Forks of the Ohio. And uh, There he was serving under a very patient commander, uh, General Forbes, had a very serious disagreement with him about how to approach 
with troops the French fortification at uh, British Cold Fort Pitt. Uh, there was a long, long discussion, uh, mostly through letters with Forbes about what their proper route should be, whether a new road should be cut up the valley. And um, that was uh, Washington, I thought, did not handle that very well. In the end, of course, the French abandoned the forks and the British uh, took it after a tremendous effort. uh, And Washington soon after left the army. I've I've not mentioned the Braddock disaster in July of 1775 when the expedition to the West under General Braddock was undertaken. Washington was not in the Virginia Regiment, but he at that time he had he had resigned his commission, but went along as Braddock's advisor. I think he learned a great deal. Uh, during that expedition, even though it ended in a terrible disaster. Uh, But he was close to Braddock. He performed in some ways brilliantly himself, but he was, after all, only an an advisor. And during the expedition, he was very sick himself, but went along and, and, and performed his duty, I think, with a great deal of courage, even though he was really very, very sick himself. He left the army uh, then uh, late in 1758 after the the fall of Pitt and married Martha Custis in uh, January 1759. After the French and Indian War, Washington faced a decision that faced many North Americans. Do I become a patriot? Do I become a loyalist? Do I try some neutral course? Why did Washington ultimately decide to become a patriot? Was it his French and Indian War experiences, parliamentary taxation, a combination, or or something else? Well, uh, in some ways, uh, his uh, development as a a supporter of the American cause was that of uh, most Americans. He initially hadn't thought about the big constitutional issues that drove the uh, resistance to Britain in the 1760s and then ended in war in 1775. But he was, uh, from the very beginning, say in 1765, Parliament's attempt to tax the Americans for revenue was made. He was uh, skeptical and soon in opposition to what the British were trying to do. The British were not attempting to enslave the Americans. The American language in describing the events of the 1760s and early 70s is probably exaggerated or overheated. The British were simply, in a very clumsy way, trying to their American empire and extract a revenue from it and bring it under full control. But it was understandable that the Americans should interpret it the way they did, that is, as an attempt to really crush American liberty. And uh, Washington agreed with that kind of analysis. He was slow in believing it. He did not want to believe that the British were were really uh, taking oppressive measures measures of taxation and then, well, the early use of troops, the use of an American Board of Customs Commissioners, the whole panoply of reorganization that the Americans faced. But he, uh, from the very first, uh, wanted an opposition made to what Parliament was trying to do. And he took a fairly active part of it in Virginia. He uh, supported uh, the association for boycott. He went to the First and Second Continental Congresses. He was, in in some ways, a conventional American patriot. He was very uneasy about it. He hated what the British were doing, but he wasn't a natural rebel, and so it made him uneasy. He, at first, was especially uneasy about the destruction of the tea in uh, Boston in 1773, 
but the British response in the intolerable or coercive acts in the spring of 1774 really convinced him, as it did many Americans, that the opposition to what the British were trying to do might very well end in violence. And so I don't think there's anything terribly unusual about his is uh, the transformation of a loyal Virginian, a loyal British subject into an American patriot in Washington. I think he, his passage to patriotism was, uh, I think, very common among the Americans. Washington's revolution offers a mix of biography and military history. The military history aspects of the book don't dive deep into tactical strategies and troop numbers, but they take a reflective view of important battles. Bob, would you tell us what Washington learned from his experiences in Boston, New York City, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania? Perhaps, could you tell us how his loss at Brooklyn Heights prepared him for his victories at Princeton and Trenton? The great attacks on uh, at Trenton and Princeton uh, were, in some ways, uh, almost acts of desperation by the Americans. They, after all, had been pushed out of uh, New York and much of New Jersey and absorbed a real beating in the, on Long Island in the battles around Brooklyn. Uh, again, Washington, I think, it, it enlarged his military experience. It gave him more experience in uh, the movement of troops keeping them together, moving them, and keeping them as much as possible under fairly firm discipline. Uh, I don't know that he learned much tactically because what happened to uh, in the Battle of Long Island, uh, 1776, also in some ways was repeated in the beginnings of the battle at Brandywine, in Pennsylvania, where he was outflanked again. You could say he hadn't learned what he should have learned, but I I think he was a a more solid commander as after the terrible experiences that uh, he had had in in New York, New York City, and New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. He was a more mature commander. I think he learned some of the subtleties of... uh, American politics in Pennsylvania, for example, he learned uh, that he was going to have to deal with a variety of factions in Pennsylvania in the middle colonies. I think that was a real eye opener. But whether you can put too much on the the defeat on the Brooklyn Heights as preparation for Princeton and Trenton, I, I don't know. Whether that's really justified or not. I, I suppose every experience a military commander has in battle, in managing troops and g- getting them from here to there and getting them in position and, and, then, and then convincing them to fight is worthwhile and, and perhaps served him well. Washington seems to have experienced history repeating itself. During the Revolution, he experiences many of the same problems he faced as a colonel in the Virginia militia during the French and Indian War. Ill-trained troops, poor supply, inadequate pay um, and support. How did Washington overcome these problems during the American Revolution? And how did he shape the Continental Army into a professional and experienced fighting force? He certainly faced uh, the problems, as you state them, over and over again. I think uh, uh, if you want an example of his his will and his judgment in action, you can see them in his role as an administrator, that is, an, uh, somebody handling logistics, somebody re- getting food and recruiting troops and seeing that arms came to them and did all the things just to keep a group of men alive and prepared to fight. Uh, He had to do that over and over again because short enlistments cut down on the continuity of experienced people. He would get a group of men in the Army who were experienced, and before long they would be going home because their enlistments 
might be as low as uh, six weeks or more commonly three months or six months. And as you know, that this was a war that extended over just about eight years. And uh, so he had the same kinds of problems over and over again. He dealt with them in part through skillful and graphic appeals to Congress. Congress, after all, was responsible for obtaining the funds that supported uh, the military effort. He dealt with the Congress, I thought, very, very skillfully. He was never hysterical. He was always calm and talking to them. And yet the sense of urgency that he felt was clear in, in the letters that he sent to the president of Congress and to other members and in dealing with the congressional committees that visited his camp throughout the revolution. He talked to the congressman with uh, respect and uh, did not conceal the, the difficulties from them that he was facing, uh, but he didn't overstate them. Uh, it was very hard to overstate when they were so, so dreadful. But that, that's the way he handled it, and, and uh, he, was just a, he was a very skillful military diplomat. And he, and he also took orders from Congress. That is, he, uh, he, was, he was respectful, uh, and he did not denounce Congress. He didn't lead any kind of subversive attempt to reform Congress or do anything like that. The civilians were in charge in Congress, and he would follow their orders. He, he provided really a splendid example of, of a uh, responsible policy that put civilian authority in the prime position. He was, he was the instrument of Congress, and he did not let anybody uh, forget that. Now, how did Washington deal with the French entry into the war for independence in 1778, 1779? Did he ever worry that Congress would try to replace him with the Comte de Rochambeau or some other more experienced French officer? He uh, was delighted uh, by the entrance of the French. He knew that the French had much to give, especially through the French Navy. The colonies, of course, lacked a... Uh, a navy, though it had a, a number of ships in a navy, but they lacked a powerful navy. Couldn't really, uh, they didn't have the, a big ship navy that they would need to to deal in any large scale combat with uh, the the British navy, which was a still a superb navy. So Washington was was delighted to have the the French in the war. He was. Secure in himself, and he did not, as far as I can tell, worry that uh, the Congress would seek to replace him with Rochambeau uh, or any more experienced French officer. Uh, by the time the French came into the war, of course, in 1778, uh, Washington had been at it for uh, really uh, three years, a little over three years, and Oh, he was probably as experienced as almost any French leader, uh, not as experienced as Rochambeau or some of the older French officers. But he was—he was no child. He was—he was somebody who knew what he was doing, and uh, he was very secure. Uh, and so I don't think he worried at all about his replacement by uh, Rochambeau or any French officer. One of the things that surprised me when I read your book was how much the French actually admired and respected Washington because of his long service in that war, and that they were happy to support him when they could. Well, that is, uh, in some ways, a surprising element in this whole story. The, the French, uh, the especially French aristocrats, uh, somebody like Lafayette or just about anyone, any great French officer you can name really came to admire Washington enormously. To explain it is very complicated. I, I think I understand at least a part of the the attitude. For one thing, uh, there is the presence. That is, Washington was a presence. He was an impressive looking man, uh, a tall, upright, uh, handsome man, 
And the way he conducted himself, uh, he must have seemed to the French, well, he did seem to the French to be like themselves in, in many ways. They also respected what he had done. It's very clear that they were quite impressed that this man could take a uh, divided country, if indeed it could be called a country or a nation, and create an army out of the uh, raw recruits that came in and out of his camp year after year and fight as effectively as, as he did. There was no question about his personal courage. Everybody knew uh, that his courage at times bordered on a kind of reckless uh, behavior of him of himself. Uh, he did not hesitate to put himself in the way of, of bullets and, and, and conflict. Uh, and then the way he talked to them, he, he spoke to them directly and very honestly. It didn't again he played it straight but it was the natural his natural kind of conduct he's very honest uh, straightforward with them didn't hide his difficulties didn't exagger exaggerate them uh, they learned very soon they could trust him and he also made good sense one of the things i think the french really appreciated was his understanding of power, and especially if you just limit it to military power, how he understood the uses of naval power. They didn't have to tell him that the Navy, uh, the French Navy, could play a key role. Uh, he, he said over and over again, we can't do anything without the French Navy by in the way of large operations that, that involve the movement of uh, the Continental uh, Army. So in every way, he was a reassuring, a, a forceful, and impressive figure for them. And uh, they really, uh, the, the people that you're talking about, really, uh, in their private writings, uh, are full of praise for him. So what was Washington's reaction at the Franco-American victory at Yorktown in 1781? Did he really think that Cornwallis's surrender meant that the en end of the war had come? Did he did he do a dance? Maybe did he smile? I mean, what what was his reaction like? There's no description of a of physical exuberance over the British surrender. He was pleased, but he certainly did not think that the war was over. Uh, he took it very coolly, and and uh, said uh, explicitly that. He was worried that people in America would, including Congress, would say that no more effort really was necessary. The war was over. He, he recognized immediately that the, there was a danger that the American effort would uh, really ease up after or with the surrender of Cornwallis. And he said, no, it wouldn't. And he pointed out that the British still had a large army in America. They, after all, held New York and had a real army there. Uh, the surrender at Yorktown had not uh, damaged the British Navy in any real way. Uh, so it was, it was in existence. And then there was the army under Henry Clinton up in New York and elsewhere in the colonies. So, so Washington said over and over again, the war isn't over. We mustn't ease up. Uh, that was coupled with a uh, great suspicion of the British anyway. He did not think that they would believe that the war was over and that if they said anything that, that indicated they wanted a peace as a result of Cornwallis' surrender, that they could not be trusted. That suspicion and dislike of the British uh, continued till uh, really after the war. Really, uh, well, I think. I do not like using the word hate in describing any of Washington's attitudes, but there were times when he hated the British and was very suspicious of them. And certainly coming back to the center of your question, he did not think that the war was over at the end of uh, October in 1780 war when the British surrendered. Let's transition to the time warp. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. The 
the time warp. Historians can't predict the future, but they can speculate about what might have been. Are you ready for your time warp question, Bob? <laughs> yes, I'm bracing myself. Go ahead. One of the aspects of your book that really fascinated me was Washington's contemplation about whether or not he should attack the British while they were occupying Boston in 1775 and early 1776. So your time warp question is, in your opinion, what might have happened if Washington had ignored the advice of his officers and attacked the British while they occupied Boston? Do you think Washington and the Continentals would have defeated the British? And and how do you think that this action would have changed the course of the war? Well, it is a hypothetical question. Uh, it is. I think it's about a 50-50 proposition. Uh, they would have had a chance in an all-out assault across the bay if it were frozen over against the British. But if the British had prepared themselves, if they had gained uh, a... Uh, prior knowledge that uh, an attack was coming, an all-out attack was coming, say, in the winter of 75, 76 across the bay, uh, and it had really prepared fortifications to meet such an attack, uh, I think it, the attack probably would have failed, given the fact that the American army uh, still was not that good. And it had been sitting in emplacements and camps all around Boston. It hadn't had a lot of training. It still wasn't very well equipped. There was a core of really good troops there, to be sure. But uh, on the whole, the British Army was uh, a superior fighting force. So I, I, I think probably in... in uh, unless things have really broken the American way, the British probably would have defeated that attack. It would have made a, a, a great difference depending uh, on what American losses were. If the, if the losses had been terribly heavy, it, it would have been very hard to put together a, uh, a new, sizable American force. So. Uh, on the whole, I think it probably was a good decision to hold off and wait until, well, they held off until March, of course, got up in Dorchester Heights and threatened the British with heavy artillery. And, and the British, did, sick of the place by that time, really did get out. Well, thank you for entertaining that question. I was really curious to know your thoughts, um, because it seemed like that decision of whether or not to attack Boston really kind of got under Washington's skin. He was really thinking about it and, and wanted to do it, but held off. Well, you're right. Um, it did get under his skin. He had to restrain himself, I think, many times during the revolution. He really wanted to get at the British. He wanted to inflict pain and suffering on them. <laughs> Restraint and cool common sense, I think, stayed his hand. Would you tell us about what aspect of history you are researching and writing about now? Well, I've got a couple of things going. I've been thinking about and have written a part of a manuscript on American 20th, great American 20th century narrative historians. So the principal figures in it would be Samuel Eliot Morrison, Alan Nevins, uh, the great Civil War historian and Arthur Schlesinger, Jr. What I've been working on really off and on for a number of years in retirement is a uh, very different kind of book for me and a different field. I've been, uh, I've always found the 19th century interesting and I've always found Mark Twain interesting and the Mark Twain papers, the central source of of the Mark Twain body of papers is in the Bancroft Library here in Berkeley. And so I've been reading Mark Twain's letters and letters to him as well as his works and a good many 19th century American writers as well. 
the letters are really uh, fascinating. There's an enormous number of them. Uh, the editors in the project estimate that there are almost 12,000 letters that Mark Twain wrote throughout the course of his life. And there are about 17,000 letters to him and his family in the collection, plus all the the manuscripts that have survived and a, a great printed collection as well. So I've been thinking about writing a book about Mark Twain and the Gilded Age. That sounds like a really fun project. So good luck. And I hope you have a lot of fun with it. It, it is. It is. It's it's really I I find myself laughing an awful lot while I'm reading his letters <laughs> because he was a, a really a terribly funny man. Where is the best place to look for more information about you, your work, and how to get in contact with you? If people want to get in touch with me, they can always write me in care of the Department of History. Well, we'll include a link to your email address in the show notes page for this episode. Well, Bob, thank you so much for joining us today. You have really helped us gain new insight and a new appreciation for the man that Washington was. So thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you. It's been fun. Washington is a man that historians can appreciate. Not only did he possess an interesting and respectable character, but he learned from the past. Washington tried to improve his leadership skills and military tactics with each battle he fought and each challenge he faced because he wanted to be successful. So he looked to history to help him obtain that success. I found it very interesting also that Washington decided to become the patriot that he was the way most Americans decided that they wanted to become patriots, loyalists, or neutrals. I mean, George Washington today is an iconic figure and not one you think of as an ordinary American. And yet, he was the staunch patriot that he was because like many Americans, he started the revolution as a frustrated British citizen. He was frustrated with parliamentary taxation and with parliament's attempts to bring the colonies under closer control. So Washington started the revolution as a cautious patriot, and later as the cause developed, he became more staunch and devout in his patriotic beliefs. You can find more information about Bob, his book, Washington's Revolution, plus everything we talked about today on the show notes page for this episode. You'll find it all at benfranklinsworld.com slash zero two six. Did you like this episode? Do you love this podcast? Please tell your friends, family, and fellow history lovers about us. You can send them to benfranklinsworld.com. You can tell them to find us on Stitcher or iTunes. Um, but please, most importantly, just tell them that we're out there so we can help bring great history to your fellow history lovers. And finally, I would love to know your answer to the time warp question. What do you think would have happened if Washington had attacked the British while they were in Boston in 1775 and 1776? Send your answers to Liz at BenFranklinsWorld.com or tweet me at Liz Covart. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today. <laughs>